one, two, three, 300 ounces. So I would like to have your inputs at the end of the presentation also. Uh, this is actually not a research paper. What I'm going, whatever I'm going to speak is, I'm, I'll be sharing my experiences of last 30 years in teaching anodontics. Some of the slides which I'll be showing, you may not agree to that. The statements might differ. The concepts are different. But I'll definitely like to, definitely like to have a debate with you once the presentation is over. So thank you, Fifth American Dental Congress, for giving me time to share my views. This is my college where I work. It's a very old medical university in India, more than 100 years old, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Actually, the presentation title got a little mixed up. The actual title which I wanted to present is Anodontics, the present is perfect, but the future is tense. Somehow it got mixed up to past, present, and future. What I'll be discussing in next half an hour or so is the present 10 trends in anodontics. The therapy which we are doing nowadays, despite all the availability of the modern gadgets, we are doing it blindly. We are following the instrumentation protocol very blindly, as per the demand of the companies, which are literally dictating us to do the treatment as per their whims and fancies. So are we doing it blindly now? And where are we at fault? Or we are doing it blindly with some support of some equipments and gadgets to our asset. So what is the future for such treatments now? If you look at the success from the success point of view, the criteria can be evaluated in terms of clinical success, histopathological success, and radiographical success. In anodontics, it has been observed that if you do a good anodontic treatment with a good restoration, the success rate is in the field of about 91%. If you do a very poor endo, but a good post-op restoration, the success is still fairly okay, it's about 69%. But a good endo and a poor post-endo, the success rate drops to about 44%. And a poor endo and a poor restoration is naturally a failure. So we are very often frustrated by the complexities in the treatment in the field of anodontics. There is something which is basically going wrong with anodontics. We need to look at that. So the present, as of now, with all the modern equipments and gadgets, looks perfect. But the future of the treatment in the field of anodontics, shall we continue to do it in the same way, is a little bit tense. Where is the tension? The tension comes when we read a statement like this from the leaders in the field of anodontics. That anodontic treatment has just become a space maintainer for implants. Now, it, that, that such a statement is very, very discouraging. Somewhere we are lacking. Something is going wrong with our treatment plan, our diagnosis, our instrumentation technique, irrigation protocol. Something is going wrong somewhere. This is the, one of the biggest confusion in the f minds of practicing dentists all over the world. When a patient comes, 
The dent dentists are very, very confused whether to advise implants or endo. Not because their implants has got high success rate, but because whether we can do a good endo or not to the best of our abilities. Then there is tension of this. There is nothing wrong with this x-ray. Excellent job done by the dentist, putting in nice implants. But the tension comes when we see a case like this done by a colleague of us. This is the real source of tension. D despite the presence of all the equipments and facilities available to us, we are landing up doing such poor cases and treatment which are forcing us to say that anodontic treatment has become and a space maintainer for implants in the near future. So we need to think that is the endodontic treatment the doom or the second life of the tooth? And this question is asked both by the dental professionals and the patient alike. As the turn of the century approaches, there, ha there have been tremendous transformation in the field of endodontics in terms of biological understanding and in terms of the fast-paced technological advances in the field of endodontics. Back in the dark ages of dentistry, all the failures of the medical profession, they, they used to blame on the dentist for their failure. Until these forefathers of modern endodontics, they came, they researched, they developed equipment, gadgets and techniques so that the success rate has gone fairly high in the field of anodontics. But still it is very disheartening when we read researches like this appearing in international journals which says that 97% of the cancer patient had anodontic treatment being done on them at any point of time. But this type of research when it is published in an international journal of repute it is very very disheartening. We all know it may be true in some cases, but not all the cases. So as I told earlier, with the uh, presence of these modern gadgets in the office, right now we are sitting very comfortably in our office, doing good endo, hoping that it will regain the number one spot which it, which it has lost to implants. And the future is tense. Why? The main reason is the way we are doing the root canal treatment, the over enlargement of the spaces which we are preparing in the canal, weakening the tooth, leading to fracture of the tooth during or after the treatment. This is making us little more scared. We all will agree that it is the time for micro now and the future is for micro-invasive dentistry. And the future looks best with these instruments which are available, which we can use them for making a fairly conservative access preparation, fairly conservative canal preparation so that we can conserve or preserve more tooth structure, improving the post-operative success rate, at least we can avoid fracture due to excess removal of tooth structure. We all will agree that magnification has fundamentally changed the modern concept of anodontics. The root canals under magnification looks fascinatingly very, very acceptable to all of us. We all are very, very fascinated when we look at the root canal through magnification. But how many of us are using magnification in the practice? Maybe in the developed countries we are using it more. In the underdeveloped and developing countries it is fairly less. But my question is, when we are using microscopes and higher magnification for locating the canal, for instrumenting the canal, do we need to follow the treatment protocol which is being followed by dentist or endodontist to prepare the canal?
So these are the main issues which will threaten the credibility of the anionic therapy because the success rate is not predictable due to various reasons. As we all know, the outcome of the therapy in cases without periapical lesions is usually 94%. And with periapical lesion, the success rate drops to about 78%. So the treatment outcome for the cases with and without periodontitis, there is a significant difference in the treatment protocol for both the cases. Single visit anodontic treatment. The in thing for anodontists nowadays, every case, everybody is doing single visit. But we must realize that in cases where apical periodontitis has settled in, they are not the ideal cases to do single visit treatment. Can you remove all the bacteria, all the microorganisms from the canal in the same sitting? The treatment protocol, the treatment goal changes. If the case is there without periodontitis, your aim of treatment is asepsis of the canal. Whereas, if the periodontitis has settled in, the aim changes from asepsis to antisepsis. So it takes time to clean the canal. So the treatment protocol is different for both the cases. We all know the bacterial colonization just now was explained very nicely by Dr. Rosalina. The penetration of bacteria in the canal, in the coronal third, middle third, deep into the tubules. In the apical third, we all know there are number of tubules are less, penetration is less. Probably this was the reason why Schilder advocated to give a conical shape to the canal so that we can do a nice canal preparation using those hand instrumentation technique with conventional instruments. Now the question arises, where and why do we fail? And the big question is, is the evidence-based research is being influenced by corporate funding? Most of the articles which we read are sponsored by some companies. And there are a number of articles available in the literature favoring one particular type of instrument technique or one particular type of instrument protocol. So we have to think twice before we select our instrumentation protocol for root canal treatment. Then the point to think of is, where do we fail? We fail in the diagnosis part. We fail in the treatment planning, the instrumentation technique, the irrigation protocol, or the method of obturation of the canal. I'll quickly go through all this. The philosophy of success. The treatment should be painless and precise. That I think everyone will agree to that. The diagnosis part, the most important thing is we must listen to the patient. Patient himself will tell you the diagnosis. This is where we often miss. We don't give time, we don't take history of the patient, we don't spend time with the patient. At least in my country where I practice, where the number of patients are too much, we hardly give any time for history taking. The moment the patient comes with a complaint of pain, we immediately jump to the conclusion, we advise an x-ray, we advise some antibiotics, and then we start the treatment. So we must spend some time listening to the patient. Patient himself will tell you the diagnosis. Then we must give some time for the radiographic reading. Very often, the change of contrast, we are able to diagnose or locate the canal which was not located or missed earlier. And the first step where we falter in the treatment is we fail to read the x-ray properly. So we missed number one at the history point and then at the x-ray point. We depend most of the time on IOPAs. A very good looking IOPA, if you change the angulation, it will look as horrible as this. 
and 70 percent of the time we are dependent on IOPA x-rays only still. For the majority of practitioners I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the anodontists who are speci especially doing root canal, but about the common practitioners. We all will agree that this is an era of CBCT. We must appreciate and understand the complexities of the root canal, which is very, very different from what it looks. And we need to spend some time to clean and shape the canal before we go for a successful obturation. Then the second point, after diagnosis, x-ray, before we start the treatment, is the lack of isolation procedures. We fail to build up the tooth. We need to do the crown buildups. When the patient comes to us, before we start the access preparation, this is the most important thing. We need to build up the remaining tooth structure before we plan to venture or open the access cavity. Normally what happens, a patient comes with pain to us with such a tooth, and the first thing we do is we put rubber dam and we immediately open the canal. Or sometimes if we don't put the rubber dam, we put cotton rolls and we open the canal. Now what we are doing then? We are opening channels for bacteria to go in. So better build up the meaning to the structure, put your rubber dam or a good isolation with cotton rolls and then go ahead with the treatment plan. These are the small, small things which we should keep in mind so that our success rate improves and the patient gets confidence in you for root canal treatment being done by you. Now the first point of discussion is taking care of remaining tooth structure and plan your instrumentation strategies. After your diagnosis is confirmed, you have done the radiographic interpretation, history taking, build-ups, now you are going to start the treatment. You must take care of the remaining tooth structure, whatever is available to us. I feel the reason for swing which is done, which is being going on from endodontics towards implant is that we are creating needlessly weakened tooth. Now we have flexible condensers, we have magnifications, we have apex uh, endomotors, but still we are creating a weakened tooth by cutting lot of tooth structure. Now if you remember these microscopes, these ultrasonic units, they were introduced in anodontics for surgical purpose only, way back in uh, late 1900s. But gradually for our convenience, we morphed them from surgical procedure and started using them for non-surgical procedure. Now if we have such asset to us of using these magnification, these ultrasonic tips, do we still need to follow the same protocol for instrumentation strategies? We need to give a big thought to that so that we can probably go uh, ahead with a both positive attitude. Now, over 50 years ago, Dr. Schilder showed us the benefits of greater taper shaping by giving a wide conical shape to the canal. Probably this was necessary because magnification and these flexible files were not available then, but now they are available to us so the aim today is to preserve the coronal dentine as much as possible for the purpose of increasing the life of the tooth. Now end treatment for today is canal which is cleansed as optimally as possible with the smallest amount of tooth structure being removed in the process which we are not doing. From the clinical point of view, conical shaping which we are doing now is justified only in a maxillary central incisor and lateral incisor. Apart from these two teeth, conical shaping is not justified in any teeth. But we are doing in all teeth, regardless of the canal, shape of the canal, regardless of the taper of the canal. Whether the canal is round, whether the canal is oval, we are using the same rotary instrumentation in all the canals. 
Majority of the teeth, they display an oval cross section, except the palatal root of maxillary molar, which is wider in the mesiodistal plane. But what technique of instrumentation we are offering? The introduction of these night eye instrumentation technique subjects the instrument to increase the amount of torsional stress and cyclic fatigue, and these two factors are responsible for separation of instruments. So for that purpose, what we did is, we started using wider files to flare the canal coronally so that our instruments go as easily with less amount of fatigue and torsional stress so that we could avoid the fracture of the instrument for the convenience of a particular type of instrumentation technique. So the widest of the greater taper instruments are used first. That is a routine protocol to a shallow depth. And then we are gradually negotiating the canal and creating this conical shape for all the canals. In turn, what we are doing is, if you look at the canal, shape of the canal, I'll very briefly explain to you. Most of the canals, we treat them as they look round. And we take our rotary files and we start not using them. Now, if the canal is like this, then what is going to happen? The rotary file is cutting here on the medial and the distal wall floor, not touching the parietal or the buccal wall. When I ask the same question to opinion leaders who are advocating road refining systems, they said, no, 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 we'll brush on the buckle and the side of the lawn. So when you brush all along, you create a big, wide, you know, sacrificing lot of heavy wood structures. Then what is the option? But everybody is using road instruments for all the cases. We are removing a lot of healthy tooth structure, which we should not do from the mesial and distal walls, often landing in thinning of those walls and perforations, weakening the tooth structure. Questions to think about. Why not keep the corner shape smaller? Probably the worst thing which we can do is to cut across the occlusion of the tooth from mesial to distal wall. And the second worst thing, to hollow out the tooth with your large round birds, your gates, and your fat rotary files, which all of us are doing, without giving a thought to it. Now, the preservation of dentine, as uh, I'll t I, without any doubt, all of you will agree that this is the most important thing for all of us while doing the canal instrumentation. So that this goal is modified by removal of tissue from the pulp space, removing the smear layer as much as possible. Any further removal beyond this is excessive and is going to reduce the length of the treated tooth, strength of the treated tooth, thereby reducing the life of the tooth. Now see this pre-op x-ray and post-op x-ray. 90% when we'll see the x-ray, we'll say what a nice root canal treatment is being done. But if you carefully see the x-ray, the initial pre-op x-ray and the post-op x-ray, you will realize that how much aggressively widen, widening of the canal has been done just for the sake of pushing our master cone till the apex in one go. We are using aggressively the instrumentation technique to force the instrument down to the apex, sacrificing a lot of tooth structure. Here you see, if you compare with the pre-op with the post-op, the clinician here has done a very good access preparation, remaining 
uh, taking care of a lot of remaining tooth structure, doing a fairly good obturation, and an excellent amalgam core. So uh, what is your object of doing root canal treatment, instrumentation? So that you can clean the canal, you can irrigate the canal properly, you can obturate the canal. Your aim is not that your master cone F1, F2, F3 goes till apex. That is not the aim. But we are practicing it with the same aim. Because we want to see a good looking IOPA. We, want, we should look for a, we go for a good obturation rather, rather than a good looking IOPA X-ray. Which is again we are promoting our treatment as a short term gain. Or as we, I'll say that space maintainer for root canal treatment. The dentine which is there in the canal after the treatment in terms of moisture content is similar to a vital tooth. The endodontically treated teeth split or break only because of our excess cutting of tooth structure. Not because the dentine or the tooth has become dry or it has become weak. We have often seen large accesses and canal shape, but this practice of instrumentation has become very popular because we are doing it blindly. Question yourself once you cut the tooth structure, very few anodontic techniques that we perform have sufficient advanced evidence to support the ideas that have foundations of such technique. But whatever research says, whatever the evidence-based research says, that is focusing most on these rotary instruments as a successful treatment. That's why I said in the earlier slide, whether we should believe in such research or not, we should believe in our own conscious, what we are doing. So we have to think whether what we should do, cleaning and shaping, or shaping for cleaning. I think we'll all agree that we should do shaping for cleaning, not cleaning and shaping. The canal should be shaped so that we can clean it properly. We all will agree that as the pulp anatomy departs from the round cross-section to a more oval or sheath-like anatomy, the rotary instrumentation or conical shaping becomes an increasingly counterproductive rather than a productive procedure. The problem is the entire, the rotary night eye file does not distinguish between the canals that are essentially round or oval in appearance. So the entire concept of this rotary night eye becomes questionable. Why? Because they are fairly prone to fracture, number one. They remove lot of tooth structure in mesodistal plane and there are lot of studies which clearly demonstrate the production of dentinal micro cracks using these rotary files. There are lot of studies which are available. Vertical root fractures have been reported or crack formation in the root dentine during and after root canal shaping procedures with using rotary night eye files. These cracks may not be clinically significant now, but there is a doubt in the mind that these cracks could propagate with repeated stress application by the occlusal forces and may result in root fracture. So this raises a big question mark. So overzealous use of rotary night eye files in all the cases should be restricted. Now how to avoid this? If you start using the instrumentation technique, using hand pieces with reciprocation at 30 degrees. And I'll advise you all to use your 2% standard stainless steel reamers to start with, not files. Start using reamers, 2% stainless steel. If the canal is narrow and torturous, start with number six. Once you're able to negotiate the canal, put them in the reciprocation hand piece after 30 degrees, not 45 degrees. 
at an RPM of 3000 RPM with instrumenting more on the buccal and the lingual plane that will give you a quick negotiation down to the working length. Start with number 6, 8, 10, number 20. Only once you have instrumented the canal till number 20 reamer, your, your first night eye file should be used. Before that, I'll advise you not to use your rotary night eye files in the canal. That is how you are going to save a lot of good structure. I do agree that minimal taper is necessary, but the degree of taper should be kept as small as possible. In doing so, we preserve more of dentine and the inst instruments are not subjected to that much stress. This simply means that in the short arc of motion generated by engine driven systems are safer than the hand motion avoiding hand fatigue completely while producing safer, more efficient and more effective results compared to your rotary night eye systems. Now once we have done the shaping, I think still we have five minutes. We have some time sir, five minutes. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So once the canal preparation is complete, we need to clean the canal spaces. How do we do it with hypochlorite and EDTA? Are they effective? Yes, but to dissolve and disinfect, we need a direct contact of at least 20 to 30 minutes of hypochlorite to the pulp tissue. But are we doing it? The hypochlorite is there just for a few seconds. Or maybe it doesn't go till the apical third. Then how do we go ahead? These are the objectives of the irrigations we all know. And these are the irrigants which are available to us for routinal irrigation. Irrigation devices, they are manual and machine assistant which will help you to irrigate and clean the canal in a better way. And to improve the efficacy, we can heat the solution, we can use sonic or ultrasonic activation, and we can use neg negative pressure irrigation technique so that we can achieve a good clean canal after a good conservative canal preparation. Then if you look at the obturation, where do we falter? Here also, we are persisting with the single cone technique now also. Most of the time we prepare the canal with a particular system and we use that master cone as a single cone obturation in molars and we are very proud that we have finished the root molar obturation in half an hour. But that is again we are promoting it for a short term period. Lateral condensation technique is from late 1900s and certain uh, centered condensation methods are today's state of art of obturation and probably no other method can fill the canal as well as this centered condensation technique in as little time as possible. So when do we obturate? We all know the criteria of obturation. There is no need to tell. We all know these uh, basic uh, criteria. When we decide it's uh, time to obturate the canal now. But till where? Here also there is a uh, problem. The problem is the radiographic apex is a poor indicator of the actual foramen. And so many cases filled to the radiographic apex are actually overfilled. And there is insufficient evidence suggesting that the filling of the apex is better than slightly short or to the natural constriction. The problem is most of the rotary file system have been designed to satisfy in vogue the continuous taper shape rather referred to as the look. That is what I was telling in the beginning. Another in thing, apical puff. We all are very fascinated when we see the x-rays. So many 
uh, forums are there on the Facebook, they'll post on photos, nice epical puff. What is epical puff? It is just pushing your sealer beyond the apex. It doesn't sh show that your canal is sealed properly. Clinical evaluation, if you so see, there's still a leakage despite the presence of the apical puff. So don't go in for apical puff. I will not suggest you. Do a nice canal, conservator canal preparation, clean it nicely, and fill your canal till the working length. In the x-ray, it will look 0.5 mm short of the apex, but that is good enough. Don't try to push your cone till the radiographic apex. You'll always overfill. So why do we continue with cold uh, lateral condensation? It is like filling a room with poles, but we are still continuing. Why? Because we are comfortable with it. We have been taught to use cold lateral condensations in our school days, and we are teaching it to the next generation also. It is like we are more comfortable taking an alginate impression rather than a rubber base impression. In the same way, we are still continuing with the same technique. Probably use single warm lateral condensation followed by single auto backfill. This will create a better seal through softened master cone and definitely is going to give you better results. So better alternative, keep your coronal shape smaller, use narrow posterior heat spreader, a single warm lateral condensation stroke followed by single auto fill back, backfill cone is the best way to obturate the canal in a more conservative way. So now the only rational and misguided reason to overshape root canals, now we, that we have nickel titanium shaping files and flexible condensers, probably none. I may be sounding a little harsh here, but there are some CD educators who will recommend substandard procedures such as single cone filling because it helps them to sell their rotary files. Then, if you ever hear from a CD course which is uh, advertised as claiming you to do any molar in 30 minutes, just run away from there. Because then you will truly promote endodontic therapy as a space maintainer for implants. Finally, to wrap up, never retreat a loser tooth. A wrong negotiation will block you in one out of three cases. If you're not using apex locator, stop doing RCTs. If you think one to two rotary files will ideally shape your root canals, you are listening to the wrong educator. If you think any irrigation technique, no matter how much improved it is, is going to get the job done in three to five minutes, you are far away from the facts. So you have to keep this in mind before you start your treatment. But shall we continue to do horrors like this? The future of anodontics is really tense. You must respect the biology and the technology Equally, they have to be balanced in deciding the treatment protocol. The future looks very bright for anodontics now if we practice it in the right spirit. I sincerely thank you all for your patient hearing. And now you can question anything, whatever you want. I know there are a lot of uh, controversies. My intention was not to uh, be go against any particular instrumentation technique or anything. Just my uh, experiences which I have uh, gained in last 28 to 30 years I'm just sharing with you my only concern is we should do whatever best we can to conserve maximum tooth structure and do a good fairly good obturation so that we don't promote our endodontic treatment as a space maintainer for implants thank you so much this is my email ID if you have any questions you can always post me later on also this is my website you can visit it any questions you want to put you can always place it Thank you so much.